Howdy, Kanaji here to talk about one of my favorite topics in No Man's Sky, procedural generation. Specifically, I want to share with you a beautiful journey across this planet in an effort to demonstrate why I think No Man's Sky's terrain generation is actually a bit underrated for what it accomplishes. So before I begin, I must first descend down to the planet Ashima. You wouldn't know it by the vast ocean before us, but Ashima is the perfect planet to demonstrate the game's impressive terrain generation. For this video, I will be focusing on the big picture, a macro view of terrain generation. I think this perspective is important, as most players will probably just land, explore for 5 minutes, and then move on to the next planet. Their perception of any given planet, therefore, is often based on just exploring less than 1% of it. Imagine visiting Earth for the first time, landing in the middle of Nevada, and then assuming the rest of the planet looked the same way. Granted, Earth has more biomes than most planets in No Man's Sky, and I'm also guilty of doing what I just described, but that's why I'm so excited to share this gameplay with you. Because today, we're going to see what this planet really has to offer. We begin our odyssey over one of Ashima's oceans. Beneath us lies an entire ocean of plants, animals, dangers, and treasures to discover, the majority of which most players will simply ignore. But I'm not here to talk about water. I'm here to talk about land. Speaking of which, land ho! With the emergence of these small islands, we begin to see what makes No Man's Sky's terrain generation so special. Unlike the first iterations of planet generation, Today's planets are capable of creating continents and oceans. Entire hemispheres might be covered in water or land, one side of a planet completely different from the other. Here we see this transition from ocean to coast. Islands, bays, rivers, and peninsulas now populate the world beneath us. Pay attention to the rolling hills and sandy beaches. Notice the gentle terrain. If we were to land here, we might think that these hills were all that Ashima had to offer. But of course, there's more to see. And as we make our way inland, the landscape begins to change. The hills are becoming mountains and mesas. The land is rising further above sea level, creating vast plains and rolling hills. Sinkholes are becoming canyons and valleys. We've clearly entered a new geological region. For longtime players, this may appear a familiar sight. After all, mesas, mountains, and canyons are features of many planets in No Man's Sky. Beautiful, sure, but predictable. Boring to some. And I will concede, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So any assessment I make will necessarily be subjective, but allow me to explain why this seemingly mundane sight is still so impressive to me. For some of you, no further explanation is needed. Math has created a beautiful landscape before you, and you are grateful. You're so grateful, in fact, that you feel compelled to leave a like on this video and to subscribe. So to you, I say thank you for your support of the arts. Leave a comment too if you're feeling extra generous. Now as for the rest of you, buckle up, because I'm monologuing about terrain generation. So why do I personally think No Man's Sky's terrain generation is successful? Well, I believe the terrain succeeds in three basic areas. It's functional, it's beautiful, and it's believable. Now I could go into detail about the technical hurdles that Hello Games had to overcome to make planet-sized terrain generation feasible on console hardware, but I'm a bit out of my depth when it comes to procedural generation and algorithms and things of that sort. Suffice to say, you can look at what my ship is flying over and conclude for yourself that it works. Yay programmers! 
It's also playable or interactive. You can run around, dig holes, build bases, and it pretty much works. Bugs aside, it works on a technical level. So what about on an aesthetic level? Well, this is where personal opinion really comes into play. I personally think it's beautiful. Some people don't. Some people don't care either way. So while I think the terrain is the best it's ever looked, there are some people who prefer the older versions. And while I can certainly see its appeal from a distance, older versions of the game rarely looked good up close. Textures were muddy and low res, terrain was jagged and unnatural, geological features often ended abruptly with sharp lines or pixelated patterns, and overall landscapes look better at distance than close up. I know, I know, I was going to just focus on the big picture for this video, but the fact that the current game's terrain looks good from both space and ground level is an impressive accomplishment. It is this point in fact that leads us to the third success of the terrain, its believability. For many players, the thrill of landing on a new alien world is an experience that is difficult to put into words. The key to achieving this impact is convincing players that they have actually landed on a planet even if they know it's simply being simulated. This is No Man's Sky's biggest strength when it comes to terrain generation in my eyes. Look around. I don't see evenly distributed noise converted to height maps. I see geologic features. I see canyons, lakes, plateaus, hills. There are caves, beaches, and cliffs. There's erosion. Beyond that, there are islands, bays, oceans, and more. The unsung variety of this single planet instills in the player a sense of history. It feels like a real place. Now for some of the more experienced or technically minded among you, you may not enjoy the same wonder as a starry-eyed new player, but try to imagine it, if for no other reason than because it's fun. Sorry, I've lost the topic. What I'm trying to say is, No Man's Sky's terrain may not generate every possible type of formation, it won't spit out a Tim Burton-esque spiral mountain. It won't surprise you every time you land on a new planet. It won't even generate all of the landscapes you've seen in its concept art. But what it will do is create a world worth exploring. A world with mountains to climb, caves to explore, and oceans to dive. A world you can manipulate and inhabit. A world, possibly like others you've seen, yet completely unique once you give it a chance. No Man's Sky's worlds can appear very similar from a distance. From a single landing, they may not offer much uniqueness at all. But when you invest time into exploring a single planet, finding all of its creatures and plants, reaching its highest and lowest points, the game will reward you with quirks and sights that often go hidden in plain sight. So while the game encourages you to visit as many planets as possible, those planets are actually best enjoyed one at a time. Now, I was originally going to end the video right there, but I still have more footage I want to share with you. So let's talk about planetary variety while that plays in the background. A small but vocal part of the community insists that the current algorithm doesn't generate as many unique planets as the old system did, that Hello Games sacrificed variety for fidelity. I disagree with that assertion wholeheartedly. However, I believe I do understand where they're coming from. Let me explain. Planets today are more varied than they've ever been. Period. Now, before you leave a dislike, let me elaborate with an example. In the olden days, say 2016, you had ice planets. A couple of other biomes too, sure, but let's focus on ice planets for now. So let's say you land on this ice planet. It either has water or it doesn't. If it does, that water is probably evenly distributed across the entire planet. So anywhere you land, you'll have a pretty good idea of what the rest of the planet looks like. This ice planet is also covered in forests. How do I know this? Well, because every ice planet in 2016 was covered in forests. The planet generation didn't have any other options. The caves on the planet? Well, they have the same colored bioluminescence as every other cave in the galaxy. The water I mentioned earlier? I'll tell you what, it's a coral reef biome. But how would I know that? Easy, because every body of water in 2016 had the same biome. It's also moderately cloudy. 
How do I know? Because every atmospheric planet in 2016 had the same amount of noise-based clouds rendered in a perfect circle above your character's head. Every single planet. And guess what? You're also not too far from a point of interest, such as a trade post or a drop pod, since this is a populated planet. Go ahead. <laughs> Ask me how I know. So I could go on and on about what this ice planet will include, because honestly, variety is very limited back then. Now, let me illustrate the difference in an ice planet in 2022 for you. So now it's 2022. You land on an ice planet. It might have an atmosphere. It might not. Maybe it has low gravity. Maybe it doesn't. It could have procedural rings covering the sky. Or maybe it doesn't. If you look over the horizon, maybe there are two suns instead of one. Maybe there are three. Hard to tell, right? It could be any of those. So let's say you land and it's a normal atmospheric planet. Great. Normal icy planet. So volumetric clouds fill the sky. Maybe it's a clear day. Or maybe this planet is one that's always overcast. Could be anything in between, really. The clouds could be tall, short, long, fat. There's a lot of variety just there. It's hard to say without visiting. Oh, but look, this one has water. That's great. That means you could land in the middle of an icy desert or on a frozen coast. Or maybe you're landing on an island that's just in the middle of the ocean. Actually, the continent generation could create one that 80% of the planet is land or only 20% is. You know, it could be entirely composed of islands and rivers, or it could just be solid land that makes this continent. Wherever you land on this planet, though, you're going to have a different experience. Speaking of water, it might be a coral biome, you know, like in 2016, but it also might not be. There are more water biomes now, so you won't know until you dive. So, let's get back to the continent, though. You land in the middle of it. Is it covered in forests? Well, I have no idea. It could be a forest, right? But it could also be a frozen wasteland covered in rocks. It could be covered in ice formations. It could be a frozen planet infested with a void parasite. So all the flora you see are infections, right? Maybe it's a frozen wasteland filled with anomalous objects from a different biome. It could even have giant flora. It's hard to say because <laughs> There's just that many options. The animals too, those are more varied than ever before. And the caves, well, don't get me started on caves, you know me and my Spelunking in Space series. But you know, you dive underground, you might find mossy caves, you might find rocky caves, fungal caves. You know, there are different possibilities. It's not going to look like every other cave in the galaxy. And of course, last but not least, we have points of interest. There are more than ever before, right? They've added colossal archive buildings, they've added hollow terminuses, they've added f crashed freighters, and these are, these are procedural, right? However, there might also not be any points of interest. You see, this planet could be in an uninhabited system, so it could be free of any sort of habitation. If it's uninhabited, perhaps it's inhabited by robotic creatures, robotic fauna. That's a possibility, a real possibility, seriously. Or maybe the planet used to be inhabited, now it's abandoned. So now there are points of interest, but they're covered in this grotesque slime. You know, doors are broken open, eggs all over the place. It's just like a creepy vibe you're getting. And that's possible too. I don't know, since I'm not looking at that planet, I can no longer make an assumption. So I know I said last but not least, but I forgot. What about the weather, right? Maybe this planet's prone to tornadoes. Yeah, like actual tornadoes or lightning storms. Maybe it's got sentinel walkers patrolling the planet. Maybe there are no sentinels whatsoever. You don't know. And if you dig underground, are you going to find ancient bones? Are you going to find remnants of crashed satellites or something else? Again, depends on the planet. And all of this is besides the terrain itself, which can now be four times as high as it could previously. So I've, I've been to snow planets where I just jumped off one of the mountaintops. It took me a solid minute to land <laughs> uh, in the valley below. It's incredible. And that's the thing. You know, 
all of this stuff, all these factors combine together so that there's just objectively more variety than there used to be. Just objectively, there are more possibilities. So case closed, right? Those people that think planets are less varied are wrong. Well, not exactly. The people that say, you know, all the game's planets currently feel very samey, they're not entirely wrong. You see, for all the variety Hello Games have added to the game, which is a lot, they've sort of shot themselves in the foot by adding a bunch of static assets, pre-made assets, to the game. Assets such as the same carnivorous plants on every planet, you know the ones, or the same types of colors for the same biome. So, you know, you're never going to get a frozen biome with uh, green snow. Why not? Because, you know, it just doesn't have that much variety. And on top of that, you're also going to get like the same edible plants, the same resources, and so on and so on across specific biomes and across a whole bunch of planets. So while the game is objectively creating more varied planets than ever before, again, objectively, the pre-made assets that are populating this game world actually makes the planets feel more familiar than they should. But why is that? Surely those objects aren't like the focal point of any given landscape, right? Well, that's correct, they're not. However, they do make up a large portion of the interactive parts of the environment. For example, you're exploring a planet, right? You're just walking. And then out of nowhere, a plant snaps at your ankle, right? That calls your attention to it. So now because it happens so often, it doesn't feel like a unique part of this planet's ecosystem because you look down and it's the same plant that bit you on the last planet and the planet before that and the planet before that. So the things that are actively grabbing your attention are the things that are the least varied, the least unique. Again, look at like biome-specific resources like star bulb or solar vines. Those are like huge groves. They glow in the dark. They're really trying to get your attention. And a grove of star bulbs on one planet will look the same as a grove of star bulbs on another planet. They just all look very similar. Yeah, they're technically Procgen in that they have different sizes, but it's the same model, the same color, you know, the same source of arrangements. So while flora, fauna, biomes, buildings, weather, caves, oceans, and terrain are all more varied and interesting than they've ever been, we're distracted by the consistency of the interactive gameplay elements that are littering these landscapes. So hopefully this is something that Hello Games addresses in the future, either by creating more procedural assets so that maybe you get like the equivalent of star bulb on any given planet or on any given lush planet. But in this lush planet, it takes the form of vines, right? In this lush planet, it takes the form of mushrooms. On that one, flowers. This one, bushes, right? So even if it's the same element, you're obtaining it through different means and different forms. So it feels like, even though, yes, it's a consistent element that you know you can find on a certain biome, you have to search that biome for that kind of plant or, or whatever have you, right? And so then you do have to explore a little bit more. You're not just looking for the same thing on every planet. Maybe in one planet, the star bulb is only found in caves, right? Or underwater. So then if you're looking for that, yes, you know that planet will have it, but you don't know where it is, right? Maybe on an ice planet, instead of always finding the element in giant plants growing above, what if they are frozen in ice, right? And you have to break that ice open to get that element. You know, little things like that. It's, I mean, I say little things, but it would be a lot of work to implement. But even things like, you know, oxygen plants, sodium plants, these things that glow and look the same on every single planet. Those could be improved with more variety. Same with uh, the crystal deposits. Like you find dihydrogen on every planet. I understand like minerals tend to grow in the same patterns across the universe. But you could probably find ways of, again, mixing that up. Maybe on one planet, the dihydrogen is in the form of a plant or an animal. Or it's embedded in rocks or ice. You know, just vary that so that planets... Yes, they have familiar elements, maybe they have familiar colors, or they glow a certain way, but they're different objects. It's not just the same object copy and pasted. And I understand that'd be a lot of work and probably be a, a technical hurdle too, but it's the kind of thing that I think would really help those players that feel like every planet is the same. 
I think that would go a long way to solving it without changing anything else. Because I honestly do believe the terrain and the biomes and the flora and the fauna and everything else I mentioned are working pretty well. It's just these few very distracting, very consistent elements kind of pulling the experience down. At least for those players. I don't mind it so much. So hopefully Hello Games addresses this in the future. But if not, you know, I'm just going to keep enjoying each planet I land on for the unique gem that it is. Even if that gem could uh, use a little extra polish. Thanks for watching this video. Let me know how I did in the comments below. I want to hear your thoughts on the game's procedural terrain generation, what works or what it can do better. And honestly, I look forward to your takes because I found that almost every player has their own opinion on the game's terrain generation. So to be honest, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to say when I first recorded this gameplay. But I knew I had to share it somehow. It was just too beautiful, you know, seeing the transition between all the different regions of this planet. So hopefully you enjoyed it enough to leave a like if you're interested in more No Man's Sky content, as well as insight into other games coming soon. Why not subscribe to my channel? I'm pretty small at the moment. Just, uh, well, what am I up to? Less than 400 subscribers. So every subscriber I get is a huge boost to my morale and to the channel's SEO. And it helps me reach new viewers. Plus, it makes me happy. So, there's no real reason you shouldn't subscribe unless you're like a monster or like really mean or something. Jokes aside though, thanks for your support. And as always, I'll see you in the next video. Bye!